welcome to this meeting uh, and a welcome to our special guests, uh, Secretary uh, Griffin Valade and uh, uh, Deputy uh, Myers and uh, also uh, Chantal Portillo of the Oregon Justice uh, Judicial Department. I'm sorry. Uh, so this is the first meeting in 2024. And uh, it's going to be busy for us because, as you know, it's a general election year. Uh, so a few uh, housekeeping reminders. You see them on the screen. So please mute yourself when not speaking and uh, raise your hand. Uh, click on this uh, button when um, you want to uh, ask a question. And you can also ask questions and make comments in the chat. Um, if you need technical assistance, also please use chat to do that. Uh, and uh, please use your webcam as much as you can and are comfortable. Uh, so I hope you've reviewed the agenda uh, that uh, was sent to you prior to the meeting. I will go over it very, very briefly because there's one change to it. So we'll start with the uh, presentation by the Secretary of State about uh, the John Lewis uh, Youth Leadership Award and um, uh, recipients of this award uh, who are our very own uh, council members. Uh, then uh, we'll go over the changes to the membership uh, of the council and approve the meeting uh, minutes of the previous meeting. And uh, originally we were planning uh, to listen to uh, an update on several projects such as a glossary and style guide uh, and uh, uh, about legislative session and uh, upcoming uh, May 24 um, uh, in, in primary election, but later we decided to uh, save uh, this time uh, to talk uh, to do the training about translation review. Uh, so we will we'll share this information that we originally were planning uh, to do um, via email, uh, but uh, the uh, bulk of the time at this meeting will be devoted to the training on translation reviews. So with this, uh, uh, I'm uh, pleased to invite Secretary of State Lavon Griffin Valade uh, to make remarks about the John Lewis uh, Youth Award and the recipients of this award. Please, Secretary. Good evening. You can hear me, right? Yes, we can. <laughs> I'm here tonight to share my appreciation of the Translation Advisory Council and to tell you about a special award. On, on President's Day, I awarded Renee and Anjou the John Lewis Youth Award. The award was established by the National Association of Secretaries of State to honor the extraordinary accomplishments and legacy of the late Congressman and civil rights leader, John Lewis. And I was so proud to see Renee's and Angelo's names and accomplishments on the screen at the January Conference of the National Association of Secretary of States in Washington, DC. John Lewis was one of the original civil rights leaders. He was one of 13 freedom riders in, in support of desegregation of buses uh, in 1961 and a leader in the Selma to Montgomery civil rights marches. He was also one of the youngest speakers at the March on Washington, where Martin Luther King Jr. famously delivered his I Have a Dream speech. Lewis continued to champion civil rights and served as a congressman for 33 years until he passed away in 2020. I am so appreciative of Renee's and Angelo's time, support, and leadership, and I am honored to share a bit about these youthful peers on the council. As you know, Renee serves as vice chair of the council and coordinated the council's community outreach work group. As a high schooler, 
She has an impressive resume with many volunteer roles and academic awards. In her high school, as well as in the Chinese speaking community. Angelo's dedication and commitment to this community is inspiring. He is an Oregon State University poli sci major, student body policy director, and a longtime organizer in both English and Spanish for local, state, and federal voting activities, just like the spirit of John Lewis. We cannot do this work of democracy without the volunteer commitment of the Translation Advisory Council. I congratulate these awardees again and thank all of you for the tremendous work of the Council. Thank you and good evening. Uh, thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, and uh, my colleagues, please uh, join me in congratulating uh, Rene and Angela on this award and wish them many more awards in the future. Uh, we are so proud of you. Great job. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, so let's uh, move on to the next agenda item, uh, which is about council membership. Uh, as you know, when the council was established in summer uh, 2022, members were appointed for two and three year terms. And for 12 members of the council, uh, their term is expiring this coming summer. So according to our bylaws, uh, people uh, can be reappointed if they wish to continue to support the council and they can serve for a maximum of two terms not to exceed six years at this point nine out of 12 members uh, whose term is expiring decided to continue supporting the work of the council uh, so i want to thank them for staying with the council and uh, continue their uh, wonderful wonderful work uh, three members uh, decided to step down. It's uh, Anastasia Gatsi, Haruka Kawakami, and Angelo Arredondo Baca. Uh, so they will be stepping down in June. And I want to take this opportunity to uh, thank these members for their great work with translation reviews and participation in other projects uh, of the Council. So thanks a lot. Uh, you've been working with the council uh, during the most challenging uh, establishing years uh, of uh, the existence of this council. We very much appreciate what uh, you've been doing, uh, and I hope that you will continue uh, be our ambassadors in the community and uh, continue to promote uh, uh, information about uh, what the Elections Commission is doing, what this council is doing uh, and uh, um, share information with your communities uh, uh, about uh, the materials that are available for voters. Uh, again, big thanks to Anastasia, Haruka, and Angela. Thank you. And uh, one more change to the council membership. Today, I would like to introduce two new members to the Council. Uh, they are Arabic language translator Sahar Basiouni and uh, Ukrainian language translator Tatiana Horner. Oh, good. <laughs> Welcome. Um, so these translators will fill the openings remaining after a couple people resigned early. So Sahar and Tatiana will be a great help to uh, the current Arabic and Ukrainian translators. So brief information about these two new members. Uh, so the Secretary of State Elections Division first collaborated uh, with Sahar as a Muslim Educational Trust Consultant to the web team about right to left directional languages and Arabic language formatting. Um, as a council member, she brings many years worth of experience living and working in the Arabic speaking community uh, and as a long term volunteer and employee of the Muslim Educational Trust. 
her work with adult and youth immigrants and refugees and translation services there have helped many people become connected in the wider community. And the Ukrainian uh, uh, translator Tatiana uh, has been engaged with the Oregon Ukrainian community for a long time, and her engagement is rooted in the passion for promoting health and wellness. She's a certified cultural specific peer support specialist and a graduate of the Oregon Health and Sciences University School of Nursing. She is passionate about providing psychological support and advocacy of refugee women and children and helping them fulfill their basic needs. She is an active board member of the Ukrainian Foundation, promoting and participating in many social initiatives, events, and rallies. So please join me in welcoming Sahar and Tatiana to the Council. Welcome. Uh, so moving on to the next agenda item, approval of the minutes of the November 1, 2023 meeting. Uh, I hope you've uh, had an, a chance to review the minutes uh, that were sent to you alongside with other materials for the meeting. And um, uh, do you have any changes or amendments to the draft minutes? Hearing none, do we have a motion to uh, approve the minutes? This is Anastasia Gatsi. I move to approve the minutes. Thank you, Anastasia. Can I have a second? This is Carolina Frank, and I approve the minutes. I second. Thank you, Carolina. Uh, now let's vote in chat, just as we did last time. Uh, put yes or no to approve or not to approve the minutes. And just a reminder, uh, all votes are um, a part of the public record. Everybody needs to respond. Our members need to respond. Yes, please. Marcia, do we have anybody calling on the phone? No. Okay. Oh, we do. I'm still here. Well, mem we don't oh. have any members on the phone. No, we're, we're here. What are we? Uh, what are we voting on again? I apologize. Who, who are you? Who are we you? Are voting? Yeah, what, um, what was in reference to for November first? I, I apologize. I got, I got a little Biden. Uh, had a Biden brain there for a second. Hey, um, are you a member of I, CAC? I'm sorry. Are you a council member? We're we're, we're here. What what was the uh, what was it, what was the vote for? Can you just clue me in here? I, I the had a uh, the slippage. The vote is for council members to vote on the minutes of the last meeting. Oh, yeah, I didn't make it to the last meeting. What was the last meeting about? Are you a TAC member? Are you a Translation Counselor, Council Advisory member? She should or are you a member of the she public? She, she, doesn't, she doesn't even know what I am. She's over here shaking her head. Um, I was just trying to get caught up so I could make a vote. Can you catch me up so we don't delay any more time? I don't want to if waste you are, public time. are you a member of this council or are you a member of the general public? Oh, well, that well, <laughs> that's that's undetermined at this particular moment. But if you could fill me in on what the November 1st was, I could I could get us going here. If you are not a member, you do not have a vote on the minutes. Ma'am, you're <laughs> I, okay. I, I have... this is Kelly Mills from the Secretary of State's office. We're voting on the approval of minutes. If you can't identify yourself by name as a member, we'll move forward. Please mute your microphone. Have all members voted? Just, just a sec. Oh. Marcel, do we have a count? Not yet. 
Okay, thank you. Um, I don't have anything from Maria or Mira. I'm sorry, can you tell me how we're supposed to vote? I, I cannot find a way. You, you, you can't vote. This is Mira? Exactly. I'm sorry. I can see Mira's vote. It's a yes. Yeah, well, I said yes. Well, okay, it's a yes for me. I, I'll just take my word for it. <laughs> we're not going to just take your word for it. Oh, my God. Secretary of State, you're going to overstep Sir. the boundary here. You're going to have a lawsuit. Sir. Sir. Um, only Stop members. muting my microphone. Not... You're overstepping your boundary. I have judicial power here, ma'am. So unless me, you want to, sir. we're going to be muting your microphone. No, you're not. We well, need we to play conduct this game all day. the meeting. Well, I'd like to. Only like... members of the Translation Advisory Council will participate in the vote. You haven't identified yourself as a member. We're going to move forward. Mira, are you on the line? Did you vote? I see your vote. Uh, yes, I'm on the line and I voted yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye. Marissa, the Kay. last one. Yep. And Maria, you were good? I'm good. Okay. We are um, 14 yes. Thank you. So the minutes are approved. So this ends the business part of this meeting, and uh, we are moving on uh, to the uh, training part of the meeting devoted to translation reviews. Uh, we are very happy uh, to have Chantal Portillo uh, today with us. Uh, you uh, received her brief bio with the materials for the meeting, uh, and you know that Chantal works uh, for the Court Language Access Services at the Oregon Judicial Department. Uh, Chantal has extensive experience in, as translator and interpreter, and she facilitates linguistic access for our limited English proficiency communities. She kindly agreed to share her vast knowledge and experience with us today. Uh, so the rest of the meeting uh, will be devoted to the training on translation reviews. And uh, we'll take a break uh, uh, approximately within half an hour. Uh, and uh, then the training will continue. Take it away, Chantal. Hi, everyone. Thank you for that introduction. Um, it is a pleasure to be here today. Thank you for this opportunity to share this time with you. And I will give the floor to Kelly to start the presentation today. Thank you, Chantal. OK, I think we're at the slide. Uh, we need to move back to the slide that says, what's it like on the other side? Great. OK, so as you know, we created this program uh, after the legislative session in 2021, and it, we've been working hard to make modifications here and there. And many of you have been working through at least five election reviews. Um, so we're continuing to learn and adjust together. And um, we've seen some of the issues that trip people up and some of the easier parts of the process. And it's a good time for us to renew our expectations for reviews and get an opportunity to hear from someone in the field who is a professional translator. Um, plus, we're welcoming two new members, as we heard, and um, this will be their first time to get any training about reviews, which begin next week for some of you. Today's presentation is meant to be interactive at certain points. Uh, you will have a chance to respond to polls and put your ideas in the chat. And um, we also know that everyone learns a little bit differently and we're all from different cultures and educational backgrounds, um, maybe more 
formal student teacher roles have been in your experience or answers are black and white. Um, we're going to take a collaborative learning approach today. It's very informal and there are no exact answers. So you might feel differently than your peers or even our presenter Chantal. And this is all welcome. We want this to be an opportunity to focus and hopefully you'll walk away tonight thinking about what we talked about and it will um, improve your experience. Next slide. I am so glad to welcome Chantal Portillo, Spanish Oregon Certified Court Interpreter and American Translator Association Certified Spanish Translator. I know Chantal and about her accomplishments because we used to work together at the Judicial Department. I was mm -hmm. the manager and she was a staff interpreter and a member of our translations team. While we worked together, Chantal studied for and passed the ATA, American Translator Association Spanish certification exam. And it's a tough one, guys. I don't think she passed the first time. The <laughs> ATA exam pass rate is less than 20% and less mm -hmm. than 2000 individuals are certified in Oregon, there are only five certified members in her language pair, English-Spanish. Chantal and I also worked together to establish our first OJD staff translation team, translators, editors, and proofreaders. And we did research to purchase translation memory software. Translation is a very difficult profession, and I know some of you are working in it. And tonight we've got one of the best right with us. Thank you, Kelly, and I'll say it right from the start, best lady boss I ever had. Kelly had this way of making you feel you could do anything and anything was possible within your workplace, and we miss her so much. Thank you so much for having me here today. It's been really exciting to learn about the work the council does with my, in, in my conversations preparing with Kelly, and I look forward to this time that we're going to spend together. Thanks, Chantal. And so did you pass the exam on the first time? I did not. <laughs> I took it three times. I was oh. very close the two first times. But yeah, it took three tries. But you know me, I like taking tests <laughs> and trying and trying. <laughs> Great. OK, yes. And um, we've got a presentation planned. And um, we've got a section we might lop off at the end, depending on how we're doing on time. But generally, if you could hold your questions, um, we'll try to take some at the end. Or uh, Chantal is willing to um, mm -hmm. answer afterwards. We will record the chat notes and um, she's willing to do that later. Hey, and the reason we're doing that is just because we're really pressed for time and we thought it would be a good idea to offer the training during a meeting so you can get compensated for your time and kill two birds with one stone. Hey, next slide. All right, Chantal, as you know from our conversation, tonight's group is a group of third party reviewers. Uh, generally, they're not professional translators, a uh, few are, and they work anonymously with the translation team. They do not know each other or their backgrounds. And this creates an interesting dynamic, especially for someone like me that sees both sides. The council reviews draft translations to ensure voters' pamphlets are accurate and culturally responsive for Oregon voters. And surprisingly, uh, I find that most of the revisions and suggestions from the council are preference and style issues rather than cultural issues or mistranslations. So it's a good problem to have. I think it will be interesting to explore some more today about that. Mm -hmm. So to start out, Chantal, although the council members don't serve in a translator role, can we talk a little bit about what it's like to give and receive peer feedback on translations from your experience? Sure. Um, receiving feedback, especially negative feedback, because we all love to receive positive feedback, it can be difficult. That is for sure. Um, but the experience can be a positive one if the feedback is given in a professional and polite way. And also the way that we receive feedback, the openness to receive feedback it affects that experience. 
So um, what I like to do is um, I put myself in the shoes of the person that is receiving my feedback and see, is that something that I would like to hear? Or is there a way that I could say this that is more professional? Um, I always see feedback as a way to grow as a professional, but it's been a learning curve. It wasn't always, yes, tell me everything that I do wrong. I want to know. So I've learned to enjoy the, that the learning about my mistakes. Um, a funny story recently, two things that I've been corrected on. English is my second language. Sometimes I pronounce things funny. So in the last year, my colleagues at work have corrected my pronunciation of accurately, which I used to say accurately, and appropriate, which I used to say appropriate. My friend, my <laughs> colleague at work told me, you say appropriate like a three-year-old. <laughs> it was a big laugh. I was really glad they corrected me, though, because those two words have to do with precision and correctness, and I was saying them wrong. Also recently at Kelly's, we were talking and I was going to tell a story <laughs> and I said, and to end on a high note, and then I said the most depressing thing you ever heard. And I thought, you know, I was using the idiom wrong. It was trying to use an idiom. I used it wrong. Really glad I got corrected because it was really depressing what I said after that high note. It wasn't a high note at all. So, you know, um. Yes, uh, receiving feedback can be hard, but it can also be a very positive experience, receiving it and giving it. Thank you. Yeah, I see people either laughing or nodding their head. We know. <laughs> <laughs> so in your work now, uh, do you work with outside reviewers? Um, I work with outside reviewers, but not unknown to me. So my reviewers at present are people that I know very, very well. So it's, it's a different dynamic than the one that you have in this council. I am very familiar though with the job that this council uh, mainly does, which I understand is being a cultural broker uh, for those translations. Um, part of my thesis was to create a series of cultural tourism routes that were based on the intangible heritage of the Canary Islands. We were very isolated for most of our history. So all that intangible heritage had many terms uh, that are unique to our islands. They don't even use them in Spain. So they were created in Spanish and then translated into English for our UK tourism market. And my thesis director did what you do for your translator. She was my cultural broker. She made sure that that intercultural interpretation and the translation was done adequately. She was Scottish, by the way. Nice. OK, so when you think about the council and their role, uh, what do you think the differences are between providing feedback as a member of a translation team and receiving feedback from unknown third party reviewers? Mm, I would say the biggest difference is that you don't know who you are working with. And, and that changes the working relationship, right? Um, um, for example, uh, when I started working with a peer review system for Court Language Access Services and the dynamics that Kelly helped create, it was mostly, it, we all cooperated somewhat, but it was mostly me and another of my interpreter colleagues that did the translation work, the bulk of it. So at the beginning, we were so polite and so wordy in our suggestions. Dear Jose, I see you have used this term in this prepositional phrase using this preposition, but after checking in blah, 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 reputable source, I have seen that it is combined. It is better to use this preposition in that. It was very wordy. It was very polite. Now we go right to the point. We just write the source in the correction, but that is because we've been working together for five years and know each other so well. So I think that's the biggest difference when you don't know who you're working with, the way that you have to communicate your suggestions. It has to be very, very polite and sensitive and done in a very delicate way. Thank you. That's really interesting. Okay, so in preparation for tonight, I. Um, 
I wanted to read about reviewers and um, what's it like. And so I started to spy or maybe lurk onto translation websites, um, mm -hmm. chat rooms, LinkedIn. I, I just Googled reviews, translations, and so on. And um, I found some quotes because there was this dialogue going on. And I thought that um, we could respond. I'd like you to respond to some of the quotes. And um, okay. I think we can learn from it. And we're going to run a couple of polls um, for the same time. So the council will have a chance to weigh in also. Okay. So hopefully this will work. Next slide. A good translator doesn't get hung up on words or syntax because they are able to capture the intended core message and facts. Hmm. All right. What do you think? Um, I would agree um, if the words are the appropriate uh, appropriate <laughs> um, term equivalents for the target language and the syntax is correct. But I, I would say that if it's correct sy syntax and the translation is correct, um, there is no need to get hung up on different wording. Um, balance is key, especially when you're working in a team because at the end of the day is about creating a document, a translation that the target audience will understand that is culturally appropriate, appropriate and that fits within that time uh, cost constraints that we have when we're translating. Okay, we have some responses. All right. Check out your peers. Um, so balance is key. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I am lost my spot here. Okay, so here's something crazy. This this quote mentions syntax. And when you and I were talking, and I told you about our three categories, cr critical, mechanical, and preference and style, you told me that syntax should actually probably be in critical category. Um, so I humbly accept your feedback. <laughs> but can you tell us why you feel that way? Um, because syntax is grammar, and correct grammar is essential for a quality translation. So, okay, that's it, it's and not we'll a be... preference; it's it's grammar. Okay, so mm -hmm. we'll talk about mechanical and syntax a little bit later. Um, okay. But how about wording? Is it okay to prefer your own wording? Um. It's okay to prefer, but that doesn't mean impose. Um, and it's also okay to respect the wording uh, of the translation if it's accurate. Um, also, if you have a glossary and, and you do for this committee, there's no need to spend time on those terms that are already in your glossary. And let me add, I was so impressed by the glossaries you've created in such a short time that are so huge, like 500 terms. It's an incredible job. Glossaries are so important for the types of translations that you work with because they have so much specialized terminology and it saves so much time, right? You've all dedicated time to choose a term after back and forth. So that is decided and done. And, and most importantly, when you have a glossary and you use certain terms uh, consistently, that gives cohesion to your translations which in turn will make the materials easier to understand for the target audience in the long run. So super impressive, your glossaries. Thank you. Okay, next slide. So let's talk a little bit about our, our mechanical uh, category that maybe we'll be changing. Um, so we describe that as something that's inconsistent with this glossary or the style guide, uh, typos or typographic errors or grammatical errors, we're talking about grammar, and syntax. And we describe syntax as unnatural elements or word order resulting in more than one interpretation or meaning. So what about word order relates to syntax? Hmm. So syntax is the part of grammar 
that dictates the internal structure of a language, the way that we rearrange words in your in that in a given language so that it makes sense. And, and I'm sure we've all had this experience, right? We are reading a translation into our mother tongue, and all of a sudden we read a sentence and we get that feeling, oh, that looks weird, which is a valid feeling to have. I don't think it's a valid comment to make, but it is a valid feeling to have. Like I, I have it many times when I'm reviewing, it's like, oh, that sounds odd. And the reason that it might sound odd is maybe because there is a syntax issue. Um, so um, maybe the, if you rearrange what you have just read that sounded odd, it sounds better, it sounds more natural, it flows better. So all syntax rules are grammar, but not all grammar is syntax. Grammar um, includes the rules that the speakers and writers use in the creation of clauses and phrases. And it also includes phonology and morphology and phonetics and semantics. Syntax rules are only concerned with the way we arrange words. For example, my two working languages are English and Spanish, and the most common syntax is uh, subject, verb, object. Subject, I, verb, love, object, strawberries. If I say, I strawberries love, you understand what I'm saying, but there is a small break in communication, maybe not complete, but there is a break in communication and we want to avoid that. And when you are translating, especially as you get tired, it is easy to start following the structure of the original too closely, which can create those unnatural flows, those, oh, that sounds weird. And I'm sure if there's any interpreters in the house, I'm sure this has happened to you as well. When you get really tired, you start getting too close to the original. That can make the interpretation sound unnatural. So it's definitely something to watch out for when we are reviewing translations. Thank you. That's a lot. <laughs> and we don't <laughs> expect everyone here to be linguistic uh, experts, but that's very interesting. And mm -hmm. word order matters. And sometimes it can change the meaning. It does, okay. yes. Great. Let's go to the next slide. All right, what do you guys think, Chantal? Don't change anything just to prove you're doing your job. Yes, this is a big agree, um, but it is also something that I have to pause when I am in my reviewer role um, because you have the feeling I'm in a reviewer role. I should be, you know, suggesting reviews or making changes to what I am reading. Um, so, um, what I tend to ask myself is, is this an accurate translation? Is this communicating what the original is communicating? Um, is it uh, conveying the same meaning and intent as the English into the non-English language? Is it grammatically correct? Um, is it offending or confusing local readers? If all those things are off my list, then it's just a style preference. And I have many as a linguist and as anyone that works with languages, I have many preferences in style and in wording, but I'm also very big on efficiency. And for a review to be efficient, um, you need to comply with certain things, which is being fast and being productive. And, any, and Kelly has told me about your time constraints. They are big. So I imagine you don't have a lot of time for rewording um, things that are already correct. So, so yes, it's, it, it's difficult, but if there's nothing to change, then even better. Okay, I see some nodding heads and it looks like a lot of people are agreeing on that one. Feel free to uh, go ahead and vote on the polls. And so what I'm hearing is it's kind of like the English saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? <laughs> um, yes. But I can get myself get stuck into a little bit of a perfectionist mode, uh, which really slows me down. Um, it's hard to let go. What do you think? It is. And I am also a perfectionist. 
But I had to learn. (laughs) I had to learn early in my translation career that if I wanted to work as a translator, it also had to be cost efficient. In an in an ideal world, we would have all the time that we needed or that we wished we had to do a translation and then review it and then let it rest and then review it and let it rest because you can always say things better or say things more beautifully. But when I worked for the private sector, and I still do some work for the private sector, the deadline is always yesterday. I don't know why. When people need a translation, it's always yesterday. So um, so I had to learn to be efficient. I had to learn to focus in my reviews on mistranslations, grammar errors. And if I had time, which you never do, then move on to my style and wording preferences. But I I tend to leave those to the end and take care of the things that I consider make up a quality translation. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry that poll isn't working for some of you. We've got another one. Let's see if it works this time. Next slide. Kelly, can I ask a question real quick? Uh, David, yes. Before we move on, I'm David Jones. I'm the uh, Tagalog um, translator member. Um, And sometimes, um, and part of this is because the um, unofficial national language of the Philippines is Taglish, um, where they mix a lot of English words with with Tagalog words just as part of the way they naturally communicate. And so sometimes when I'm doing translation reviews, some of the translations um, just occasionally insert English words, um, which um, I, um, you know, in some cases it's like part of a title and so that's totally understandable and you wouldn't want to necessarily translate those, but other times they just um, throw in English words that I'm sure uh, most Filipino speakers would be able to understand just perfectly well. Um, I'm just wondering where you think the line would be to um, uh, where you would draw the line between just allowing a English word to pass into the translation or to insist on a Tagalog translation, a real Tagalog translation. Um, I was going to say I broke my own rule. (laughs) I'm not (laughs) supposed to allow questions right now, but um, if we could get a note on that or you could type it in the chat and then um, we're going to follow up at the end or afterwards. But it's a great question and it also is related to our style guide. I'm sorry. Oh, no problem. It means you're engaged. (laughs) All right, we're on to this one. Uh, Inexperienced. Inexperienced reviewers <clears throat> often want to make more changes than necessary. They can end up changing perfectly good text simply because they would say it differently. And I'm going to launch this poll if I can get there. Um, this rings true, but it would also ring true with experienced and eliminating that inexperienced word as well. Just reviewers, and I include myself. Um, uh, yes. Uh, And let me answer the poll. (laughs) You're going to, oh, because it's over your your screen, sorry. (laughs) That's okay. So, and I think it happens more when you are in separate teams. Um, I think reviewers, when they work in separate teams and they're translators, when you are physically separated or just don't know each other, I think there's a tendency to make more corrections, but I think that as a reviewer, the best policy, at least what I do, is I don't look for things to correct. I just make everything is correct. And that saves me a lot of time. Okay. Yeah, and one uh, comment that I read also that I didn't put here was um, that actually sometimes reviews can insert errors into the uh, translation, which is something we want to avoid too. Okay, we got a nice mixed response on that one. (laughs) Sort of, but is a good answer. Um, All right, let's have another one. Next slide.
Oh, I see. Did the last question launch? I don't think it did. I'm going to hit again. Inexperienced reviewers often go. want to make more changes. All right, we'll let people vote. Sorry about that. And I guess I it was user error on the other one too. And regarding the comment that you can introduce errors, that can happen because you, maybe you rewrite your sentence that you would prefer to say in a different way, but then that sentence was coordinated with the previous and the next sentence, and that rewrite didn't integrate the three sentences, so now you've created a lack of cohesion. So it can happen, or maybe it's a typo because your finger just went bloop. So it, it can happen when you're rewriting that new errors might be introduced. Okay. Did that one work? I believe so. I, I voted. <laughs> Not. It says it's live. <clears throat> okay. Okay, great. Um, so yes, and I'd like to say that we, although we're not a part of the paid translation team, we're part of the team. The council it makes a very important part and um, actually a lot of other agencies and places have contacted me with interest about adding third party reviewers to their agency translations process. And I will say now. I wanted to join this council so much when the volunteers positions <laughs> came out. I sent all my paperwork right away and I was on pins and needles biting my nails, hoping that I would get <laughs> chosen. And I didn't because I thought providing linguistic access to voting, that is up there with linguistic access to justice. It is so important. Everyone has to be so proud to be part. I mean, obviously you're super proud because I just saw that three people, nine people were continuing their three year dedication. So yeah. It's it's such an amazing job that you're doing here. It's it's something to be so proud of. Oh, thank you. And I have to tell everyone she's a fabulous candidate, but our secretary was very dedicated to having a diverse group and uh, rural representation. And we were able to do that with some of our, our Spanish members. So I'm sorry, Chantal. I know. <laughs> okay, next slide. All right. If you feel something has been translated especially well, say so. Yes, it, this is a big yes. Um, it, when you are receiving feedback, it is very nice to hear that someone that has reviewed your work and spent time reading whatever it is, your translation or hearing your presentation, thinks that you've done something well. Uh, I take every opportunity I can to congratulate my colleague, Jose, who is whom I work in peer reviews with now very closely uh, to tell him that translation was beautiful, or maybe he thinks of a term that I hadn't thought about for, for a certain thing, and I can even start using whatever he chose that I was impressed by, or maybe it was a very entangled sentence in English and he was able to translate it and make it clearer without changing the tone and without changing the register. So definitely when you see something you like, I, I always say it, I think it makes your translator and reviewer team proud and it creates a good work, by, work environment, right? Because, you know, feedback is usually negative, but when you see something positive, it's like, ah, it just makes your day. <laughs> so, so that's a big yes for me. Definitely. Marcy, you wanna click once? We've got a way to say that. <clears throat> so here's a way to express that. The translation is accurate and flows naturally. Good job. Um, but you can add that there's a couple of mistakes related to abbreviations by our style guide. So mm -hmm. I love to pass along uh, positive feedback from the council to our, our translation um, vendor. Thank you. All right, we've got a next one, next slide. Reviewers should only be allowed to suggest revisions that they see as unnatural or unclear. <clears throat> mm, I, I imagine this unnatural and unclear includes 
um, mistranslations and grammatical errors and syntax errors. So it might be an unpopular opinion, but I I agree if, if that is included in that and natural and in clear. Um, because I, I like to respect the translator's work in whichever style and choices they have made, if they are accurate. Um, in an ideal world, we would have, again, endless time to go back and forth and share and our points of view. And, but the timelines are always very, very narrow. There's also budget constraints. And I know that this, this group is a group of volunteers, so you specifically don't have budget constraints, but, but the translators and reviewers you work with do have their also budget constraints. So um, in the spirit of keeping your deadlines, I and again, to be efficient, what I do is I go to mistranslations and grammatical and syntax errors. And, and try to limit my uh, style preferences for the time that I have left, which is usually none. Okay. Yeah, for me, it's the word only that trips me up. <clears throat> There's always reasons. And I think yes. I see nodding on that one. I'm gonna clear my throat. Yes, and um, we've talked about this before. In our council, we have a lot of different uh, backgrounds. And so different style preferences are going to be based on educational background, um, number of years speaking English or um, the other language, um, life experiences in Oregon or the United States, maybe formal education in writing the target languages, or experience with elections and the subject matter expertise, cultural values. We have a broad uh, generational uh, representation on the council and um, and all kinds of uh, other cultural and identity issues are going to impact preferences and styles. So appreciate that. All right, next slide. I think we're going to be taking a five minute break. Um, I do have some dates up here of things that are coming up very soon, but feel free to grab a glass of water and be back in five minutes, which will be 6.59. Let's say seven o'clock. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> See you Thank at seven. You. See you soon.
Okay, right on time. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I know Marsa and Tamara were speaking um, and we came up with a, a brief plan. Um, so public meetings, these meetings are open to the public for observation. Um, however, we have not had an agenda item in this meeting for public comment or participation. So um, we do have the right to remove someone who is disruptive from our meetings, um, who has actually been interrupting and not answering uh, basic questions to identify themselves before speaking. So we will be uh, suspending disruptive persons from this meeting and the future meetings. Okay, please just do your best to ignore and we'll be working on um, taking care of that. And Marcia will be moderating uh, any of the comments. You don't need to send meeting invites to other people and so on, okay? All right, sorry for that. It's the thing. Okay, we're ready for the next slide. All right, so uh, no surprise here. Feedback should be concise, structured, and clear. Uh, as, as Chantal said, to be on the receiving end, it has to be helpful to be a real, um, useful and a professional experience. And we work pretty hard to develop our review form. And I mm -hmm. think it's been working well, but we uh, periodically, well, we take comments on it and we did a survey um, a while back to update, update categories. And um, we'll be continuing to do that. Thank you for your input. So, um, We want to think about what happens when it goes a little bit haywire and the, the feedback isn't especially concise or structured or, or useful. So next slide. All right. No one would ever do this in this room. I know. <laughs> Wrong. Um, but we do get comments sometimes that are, are less helpful. and. Um, we would like to be more concise and um, provide some direction. So Chantal, what's your reaction to some of these? No, <laughs> it's my first <laughs> feelings like, no. <laughs> um, it, yes, it, for me, this would be a no because it feels more like a personal attack than uh, an evaluation of my work. Also, those comments are very broad and they don't provide um, a solution to the negative, which is something that makes a comment very, very valuable when you are reviewing, if you provide what you think is the correct translation or what you could think is the grammar correction that needs to be made. So um, yes, uh, th those are comments that I wouldn't like to receive myself or, or, <laughs> or I wouldn't give, give to my, my colleagues. I had to start with the worst just to be, oh, yes, to, you know, we can get to <laughs> those the are pretty, bad. but yeah, uh, Marcy, you got a couple clicks there of different ways to say that the original means X, but the translation means Y would be a way to give some mm -hmm. feedback or I interpret the intended meaning to be Y. Okay. All right, next slide. It sounds weird. <laughs> <laughs> uh, council, what would be something better to, to express it sounds weird that would be useful? Go ahead and write anything you'd like um, mm -hmm. to that question in the chat and we'll give you a minute to think. And like I said, it's a valid feeling because when you, you are reading in your mother tongue and it's from a translation, sometimes it does sound weird, but it's not a very constructive comment. Syntax is not standard. That's a great one. Mm -hmm. Another way to phrase this, I like that, yes. Great. Mm -hmm. Would sound more natural, yes. This wording is not commonly used. That one is more common. Yes, yeah, see, you're providing solutions. You're not only pointing out what you perceive as incorrect, but providing a solution, and that really gives weight to to a review comment. 
Great. Okay. So yeah, we're not using that phrase. Next slide. <laughs> it sounds like Google Translate. Ah, Ouch. everyone's laughing. And, oh my gosh. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> yes. I wouldn't like to receive that comment. Why not? Which no. doesn't mean, <laughs> why not? <laughs> well, <laughs> it, again, it's not it professional. Feels, yeah, it's not professional. It, and it feels a little bit like a personal attack more than, again, a constructive uh, comment uh, on, the, on the work that you're doing. I always try to really focus on the work and not make it sound personal. I think that makes people that are receiving the comment much more open to, to, to your comment than if it feels like a personal attack. Yeah, okay. Um, but Chantal, <laughs> what if it really does sound like Google Translate <laughs> <laughs> or a machine translation? Because uh -huh. it, it happens. What about that? Yes. Well, if it does sound like machine translation, uh, I would ask myself, and that's very easy to, to, to check because you can just put it in Google Translate and see if that's <laughs> how it comes out. Uh, but I would ask myself, why does it sound like a Google Translate? Is it because the translation used a term that is a correct equivalent, but is incorrect for this context? Or is it because the machine used syntax that is not natural? that doesn't follow the syntax norms of the language that I am working with. So I would ask myself why, and then I would provide the, the correct non-Google Translate sounding option. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, question, have there been instances of translators using Google Translate? I don't know. Um, I have ha had some concerns about mach maybe machine translation and, um, so in all seriousness, if you have that, we would love to pass along that feedback to our vendor because it, that's not the translation team that we want. But what's more difficult is if you can give it to us with some um, concise examples or reasons why you believe it. So I think one of the things I see with Google Translate is it's often out of context. It's a word mm -hmm. um, that, that doesn't quite fit there. And so, yes, I, it's not a huge problem, um, but give us some something we can use. That happens. Okay. All right. Yes, we've got some great comments there. People who work in this. Thank you. Okay. Next slide. Oh, here's a quote. <laughs> <laughs> it's me. <laughs> I have never met a translator that felt like they had ample time to work on a project as to go back and forth between one wording or the other. And if they do, then it becomes a non-profitable project. Chantal Portillo. Um, so yeah, translators are, time is important to them and reviewers, it's important to them. So um, we have these crazy deadlines. Yes, and I have colleagues that are excellent translators, but they can't let go of certain things. <laughs> and doing translation is not efficient for them because it is their job. They have to make money and they have to pay bills with it. And they are too perfectionist and they just go over and over their work so much that at the end of the day, they do something else or they take very few translation projects because it's, it's not cost efficient to them. So they just know that their personality is such that they can't, it's got to, yeah, okay. Can't, I can't be their that. only source of income. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, Mars and I, well, I was changing this PowerPoint up to 530 probably, giving Mars <laughs> a heart attack because I can't let it go. <laughs> okay, so we want the, the reviews to be pleasant for everyone, um, educational, fun, it, should I say fun, um, but you know, worthwhile and meaningful projects. So um, mm -hmm. we would like you to be able to decide where to best spend your time and um, use your time wisely because we have a lot of material, a lot of repeat material. 
Yes, and as I understand, the main role of this committee is to be a cultural broker, correct? Make sure that the translations are, um, apart from accurate, that they are, that they fit the target population here in Oregon, being culturally, that they're localized, basically, for, for your target population in the state of Oregon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the authors of the law um, we're really focused on the cultural, but there is a lot of complex information and you've seen the voters pamphlets. They're yes. very long um, and it can kind of be a catch 22. What deserves the most attention when you when Kelly Mills has told you you have 72 hours <laughs> to send them back. So it's important to consider the time. Yes. Uh 10 constraints are so tight for this committee. It's and 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 it's during your weekends mostly, right? Yes, Is that how hopefully. you hopefully I try. Hopefully, hopefully. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. And adding third party reviewers and analyzing those suggestions and then applying all that to the final drafts. Yes, I can see how it can complicate the translation process of, of your materials. Yes, yes, definitely. Uh, election laws and timelines were not written with translations and certainly not for council reviews in mind that time mm -hmm. um, built in. But I know that our translations are are high quality because of the council. Yes, they are. Again, you can be so proud of what you do. And I wish I was part of this council. Just saying it again. <laughs> OK. Um, What's worth fighting for, Chantal? I mean, it's kind of confusing. It's a catch-22. What is what is priority? What is worth, what's the hill you want to die on? <laughs> um, <laughs> for me, what what's worth fighting for, again, is inaccuracies. If the translation doesn't capture what the original is saying, direct mistranslations, that's always worth fighting for grammatical and syntax errors that is always worth fighting for. Um, yes, but you you have to adapt to time constraints and then the rest of the team that works with you has to adapt also to budget constraints. So as long as the translation is accurate meaning, preserves the tone and style, and it is culturally appropriate, I always consider the rest to be preferences of mine, which again, I have so many, but, mm -hmm. but yes, I, I try to, that's not what's worth dying for. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I know this is a, is a conflict for some of our members. Um, and we often give in the larger elections, some directive, like focus on the state pamphlet or, or things like that. We've also gotten better at dividing things up and, mm -hmm. um, spreading things among many people. Okay, next slide. Giving weight to feedback. So as I mentioned, we had a survey uh, about the review form recently. Uh, I guess it was last spring. Um, we were looking to improve it and ask for some ideas. And one of the, some of the feedback we got was um, members were, or someone was concerned that if they didn't mark something as critical, that it would get less attention from the translation team, or it mm. would be minimized or just skipped over, um, or even mm -hmm. preference and style uh, would be skipped over. And that wasn't the intention of those. Um, but would you gloss over that kind of feedback if it wasn't categorized as critical? No. Um, as a translator receiving feedback, if there's a grammatical error, I want to know about it. If there's a syntax error, I want to know. I think it's just because the word critical sounds so critical <laughs> that maybe that is why. But whatever you call it, critical or mechanical error, I think any translator would pay close attention to all comments, independently of how they are categorized. Yeah, and that's. From my where I sit, when I see the reviews come in and I see them come back, um, mm -hmm. I, I can definitely say 100% that all of the the um, time it, that took to give some feedback is considered, definitely. So um, yeah, maybe we need to rename these. Uh, what was the one we used to have? We had critical, um, 
minor, I think, and that certainly didn't work. So they're all valuable and they all carry weight. So don't worry about that. All right, next slide. Doing great on time, by the way. All right, so here we are in Oregon. Am I frozen? Or the next slide? Mm, nope. Frozen. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, you mentioned localization, and um, mm -hmm. Catalina's tried to explain this to me several times. <laughs> um, marketing and branding and localizing, and I've read and heard about it, but I'm going to ask you again uh, <laughs> to weigh in. And you know, election material is difficult. It's very specialized and it's difficult for non, even native speakers. Um, mm -hmm. So we're talking about decriminalization of drugs. Here's one, behavioral health facilitation through the supervised use of psychedelic drug compounds. Um, mm -hmm. That was last general election. And, you know, I think some, can we just call it magic mushrooms? <laughs> well, <laughs> no, we can't, but that's what they are. Um, and land use zoning and the difference between a, an optional obligation debt bond and so on. And so we've been wrangling with a lot of those terms. It's just, it's difficult and it's very specialized. Um, do you think culturally appropriate translation should include adding information uh, to explain things that isn't there for the English reader? Um, so it, it, it depends. And this more or less will answer that question that we got at the beginning. So if there is an okay. equivalent term in the non-English language for that English term, it is always preferred to use that equivalent term um, because that is richness of language. If we start just using English for many words in our own language, then we lose that diversity of our language, right? So if there's an equivalent term, I would say use it. But sometimes there are no equivalent terms. Sometimes it is a cultural concept that doesn't exist in the non-English culture. In that case, what you need to do, Levi, <laughs> yes. <laughs> in that case, there's different methods that you can use. You can provide a brief description of whichever term. You can use the English in a brief description, description in parentheses, but whatever you do, it has to be very brief um, because, as you said, elections are confusing. Election materials are confusing. They should be as confusing for English speakers as for the rest of us. Um, <laughs> it's like going to court. Uh, English speakers are confused in court just like the people I interpret for my court users with limited English proficiency. Um, it is not my job when the counsel is speaking with their client and they're using all this legalese and this complex sentences and, and complex, complex concepts to lower their register so that person I'm interpreting for can understand. We all have to be on equal footing and just as confused when voting or when in court. So. I hope that answers the question. Well, that's pretty tidy. I think it's more complicated, but OK. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've also been learning about transcreation. I think Catalina was, is, was um, schooling me on that. But, you know, sometimes the words don't exist. And so mm -hmm. this is really important for us to think about how to best convey the meaning. And this is uh, an opportunity for people to send in ideas about our style guide if we want some kind of uniformity and when we deal with those things. And um, we, can, we can think about that. Um, and our information in the voters pamphlets uh, is official government information. And so also by default, it's educational to how to register, mm -hmm. how to vote, your rights as a voter. Um, but we are trying to follow the philosophy and hold relatively firm that we aren't inadvertently making a special cultural voting guide for a particular community. Um, that would be a different kind of project than translating mm -hmm. the English voters pamphlet. So we want it to be equitable in all languages, even English. Um, so the other thing that uh, I wanted to give guidance to the council is plain language or um, difficult English that could be improved. If we can improve the English source text, 
please send it in when you're working on things. Uh, we don't have control, for example, over what the county clerk will put into their county pamphlet, but we can certainly pass along information and uh, our feedback, positive and mm -hmm. Uh, constructive feedback. And also there's opportunities like, oh, my cat's here. <laughs> um, oh, Lucy. So yeah, last summer you were all working on the voters registration cards and they're being re, um, redesigned. That's my cat. Um, and we got some feedback about a uh, driver's permit, for example. Um, actually, it didn't say that. It said uh, when an acceptable idea is a per I identification is a permit. And um, it was pointed out that newcomers may not know that permit means an instructional or provisional driver's uh, license. And so mm -hmm. um, we pass that along to the, the voter registration card committee. So please let us know um, and we will do our best. Um, okay. And you did mention localization a little bit earlier. Um, can you just say a few more words about that? About that. Sure. Um, so translation is the process of converting text into an from one language to another, focusing on the message, adapting that message while maintaining accuracy. Localization goes beyond translation and adapts the <clears throat> excuse me the entire product uh, to a specific locale or tag target market, and and it's easy to understand with this example. Imagine you are translating a recipe and the English, and it's English to Spanish for Spain. And the English reads, cook two pounds of cherries at 150 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm going to translate in English. So imagine I'm saying it in Spanish. To localize it, we would say, cook one kilo of cherries at 65.5 degrees Celsius. So there you have localized those pounds and, and that Fahrenheit into the measures that are used in Spain. So that's that's localization. You're muted, Kelly. Thank you, because I'm worried about my cat. <laughs> <laughs> so in Oregon, we're working with communities that speak languages other than English as their first language. Um, and we worked through some, I don't know if this is called localization, with the Vietnamese reviewers. Um, for example, the translation team must be based out of California for Vietnamese, and they kept mm -hmm. uh, providing a Department of Motor Vehicles translation, the name of the agency, uh, as they did it in California. And um, mm -hmm. our faithful Vietnamese reviewers didn't give up and said that this wasn't kosher. We weren't using that term in Oregon. And uh, in fact, the other term seemed a little archaic. So that was definitely some cultural uh, appropriateness for Oregon, as well as probably some localization. Okay. Yes, that, that was localization. Oh, I got it right then. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so how could we communicate when there's something very specific to Oregon or speakers uh, in Oregon of a particular language? Um. You can say things like the name of this agency is translated as such in the state of Oregon or the community, the target community for these materials in Oregon uses or is used to seeing this translated as mm -hmm. such. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, we put one up there. This term is most commonly translated as X in Oregon. Um, I've also seen mm -hmm. some great uh, comments that say something along the lines of, for the Oregon Ukrainian speaking community, um, this is uh, better understood or more commonly used in Oregon yeah. government mm -hmm. materials, things like that. So very good. Mm -hmm. Okay, next slide. Okay, so we've got some more kind of practice. We hope you can participate. Um, there are no right or wrong answers here, but these are our three categories. And you'll remember um, critical is going to be offensive, culturally inappropriate, or uh, really a mistranslation and the meaning is, 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 is wrong. Wrong. Um, ouch. And then mechanical, we've talked about that glossary and style guide inconsistency grammar errors, type, typos, or syntax about word order. Um, 
resulting in more than one interpretation of meaning. So holding close to the meaning. And then preference and style is uh, synonymous, non-glossary terms or preferred word order, which doesn't affect the meaning. Um, and of course we could go on and on and make those really long, but um, those are the basics. So we're gonna work on that. Um, also, I wanted to mention there was a nice comment um, a little bit a while ago that uh, the meaning, a different meaning than the English intent, um, making sure also that it it meets the intention of election laws and processes in Oregon. So sometimes the translation might be correct, but it doesn't quite work for elections in Oregon. So that's something else. Um, I would call that critical, but again, we'll weigh we'll weigh all of it. Okay, so get your chat ready. You're gonna be typing in what you think some of these are. Let's go to the next slide. Council. Leave Oregon untranslated per style guide. What category do you think that is? Again, there's no right or wrong answers and um, the categories are relatively broad. So don't, don't be concerned that um, there's a black and white answer here. Okay, let's do a next one. We're gonna move through these. Suggest changing to use this Chinese character. Otherwise, the translation has a negative connotation, almost suggesting torture. Oh, let's torture the voters. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely cultural there. Mm -hmm. Hey, lots of agreement. Uh, how about the next one? A cast ballot is a noun, not a verb, to cast a ballot. Did you categorize that one? And I don't like that word, by the way. I wish we didn't have to have it in our glossary. <laughs> okay, it's all over the map here. Nouns and verbs makes a difference. Okay, here's one. This is a more inclusive and respectful way to describe people with visual disabilities. Not everyone is um, has evolved in some of the terminology. And inclusive and equitable language. Very interesting. Okay, got some details there. Here's another one. Preferred synonym is, and I can't pronounce it, Vietnamese words, trinder. Are you playing too, Chantal? I am not. <laughs> he was taking a little break. <laughs> gotcha. I am reading the answers, though. The Oregon community will be confused by translated term. That old example of drivers. Well, I don't even see drivers. Permit. Mm hmm. Yeah, I can see that there's a lot of interpretations. Okay, I prefer this word order for natural flow. We do this now so you stay awake. Wow, that one's all over the map too. All right, this sounds more natural to me. And Voice of America uses this term too. So Voice of America is a US government, um, I guess it's a internet and radio networks around the world to um, have sympathy to the American foreign policies. Mm -hmm. Okay. The meaning here is 21 days before the election is the ultimate date, not the minimum date. Yeah. 
have had that one come up in one language. You can turn in your ballot until eight o'clock on election night. Does not mean the day before. <laughs> okay. And we're moving right along. I hope you enjoyed that. Again, it's just food for thought mm -hmm. and ways you can say things and what, what they they um, might go with. All right, we'll do a couple, just a little bit of final talk about language authorities. Chantal, you wanna tell us about those and why they're important? Sure, so language authorities is what I've called tonight reputable sources or renowned sources. They are also called language academies, and they are um, the entities whose mission is to arbitrate, unify, and promote the correct usage, usage of language. So languages are evolving beings. Languages are alive, just like people, and they change <laughs> throughout time. And language academies um, take maintain record of the evolution of language, and again, they uh, also arbitrate and unify and promote correct correct usage of language. And most languages have a language authority. For Spanish, we have La Real Academia Española, the Royal Academy of Sp uh, the Royal Academy of Spanish. We have the Institute of Linguistics of Vietnam for the Social Sciences, the Russian Language Institute, the Academy Francaise for oh the French gosh. Academy. So most languages, <laughs> <laughs> most languages have a language authority that regulates that language. Okay, yeah, you named a lot there. I want to check into those for our style guide. And that's mm -hmm. to say that, um, you know, if it comes down to uh, the translation team and a reviewer really disagreeing on whether something should be capitalized or something, mm -hmm. um, we really need to go back to, you know, an authority on grammar rules for that language. And so um, I would love people's suggestions for their languages we can add to the style guide because it's kind of an agreement we have with the vendor. Um, they don't have to put anything in that's not grammatically correct, even if it was suggested. And if we need to, we'll, we'll work it out and figure out um, the language authority on it. So it's not the last word, but um, it's very helpful. So we did it gives a so lot of well. Weight mm -hmm. to it gives a lot of weight to your revisions when you are able to use the language authority. Yes, it does. But you got to keep that time uh, factor in your head too. Um, Always. Not a lot of time to do research. And I wouldn't expect people to, to spend a lot of time mm -hmm. researching. But it is very helpful to provide some rationale and, and legitimate resources. Great. Okay. So we did really well. Uh, we're doing great. And I think we can entertain a few questions. We have a raise your hand uh, mode in the Teams meeting, and I think it numbers them. If your questions could be as broad as possible to apply to uh, several languages and not uh, super specific to a particular language, that will be helpful for the group. But again, we can answer specific ones after. And we will be grabbing um, questions out of the chat too. You, you're welcome to write them in the chat and we'll get back with the team. And it can be on anything we talked about today. And I will try to answer anything I can. And if I'm not sure, I will research it and send the answer to Kelly so she can share it with the group. I'm not seeing any hands yet. I saw a comment here, I'll start. I saw a comment in the chat um, that Google Translate's getting a lot better. It sure what is. What do you think? Um, I completely agree. When I started translating 20 years ago, Google Translate was terrible. It is not anymore. It is actually pretty good. And in fact, my nephew who is now 14, he was starting to think of what do I wanna be when I grow up? I told him not a translator because in 20, 40 years, I don't know. I think editors and reviewers are always going to be essential for translation, but I think it's already started happening. Um, there's more translation done by machine translation, especially certain types of texts, you know, that are not literary, that are more scientific, more mechanical to translate. 
and they just use reviewers and editors and proofreaders instead of the mm -hmm. whole team. So, so yes. Yeah. And those translation chat rooms and the LinkedIn and those groups that I found, um, tons of conversation about AI. I know there's some questions about that and mm -hmm. uh, the future. It's kind of scary. Um, I said I'll retire before we go <laughs> that way. <laughs> okay, Tatiana has her hand up. What do you have mm -hmm. tonight, Tatiana? Yeah, I, um, you know, I sometimes find uh, that uh, the translation doesn't sound right but I don't have a better suggestion, like mm -hmm. caucus, for example. And mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I just write quickly, needs work, meaning for me and for the translator. And I'm trying to find, is there a better way quickly, briefly to say, doesn't sound right, but I have not a better idea. Um, so for my language pair, English, Spanish, when I, I'm reading a translation and I come up to a term with, uh, and I am not sure if it should be this one that is used in the translation or the one that I prefer. I just write in Google, uh, for example, X versus Y, and then next to it, I write Fundeu, which is one of our language authorities for Spanish. And usually something comes up and it gives me the solution of why one would be better over the other. Um, so getting crafty with uh, Google searches can help. Yeah, I think Tatiana is pretty good at that one. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, I think too, it would be okay. I mean, sometimes we'll just, again, every bit of feedback that you write, I know that they look at, and I have seen some that said, oh, try it again, or something's not quite right, um, but I don't know what it is. and. And uh, the translation team always comes back. They try it again, basically. So, mm -hmm. hey, Lowell, do you have a general question for us? Oh, did I lose Lowell? Oh, there. Nick is. Uh, yeah, okay. Just a comment. Just maybe. Uh, sorry, I, for some of my our reviews. Um, I mean, and Kelly knows sometimes my reviews are late and I'm sorry to the translation to the team that sometimes they're late because some of the, sometimes from my my language I want to make sure that the readers that are reading the language are are getting the perfect translation uh, that they get and sometimes the translations are sloppy and I, I make honest reviews when I'm doing the reviews and if I don't like it, I'll I'll put it I'll put it, put it in the comment and put in my uh, suggestion in the reviews. Thank you for that comment, Lowell. Yeah, uh, you did say the word perfect, so I'm not. Nobody's trying to attain that, but um, I appreciate that. And <laughs> the pressures again of the timeline is really challenging. So uh, we're with you. Uh, we're with you. Can I maybe? Oh, sorry, um, Kelly. Um, I think yes. sometimes the translator is rushing, but they they do the they um, they're probably rushing sometimes when they're doing the projects, but they 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 have it they're they're there. Uh, so sometimes I'm just putting in you know when I'm doing the review, just suggesting the words that they should have used. Yeah. Great. Okay. You have any hands up? There are several questions in the chat. Okay. Let's get a couple there. Uh, yes, Catalina, if you send in something about Spanish translations, please go ahead and send it in and we will gather the response. Um, if you say something like, this sounds a little awkward, but then go on to explain how, and then also suggestion for what to change it to, is it as not great? Um, so Renee, I, I'm not quite understanding that question. I think I understood it. I think mm -hmm. I think if you can eliminate it sounds awkward and give everything uh, the rest of your feedback and and what you're trying to get across will get across. I think that's what she meant. If Renee, are you good at, on that one or not? Yeah, I just meant like I think sometimes like it I don't know, like I'm just like puzzling over a sentence and I'm like it really sounds awkward. And like mm -hmm. I, like I, I do my best to like not say it like that. But so I like add in like a little awkward, um, just mm -hmm. to kind of supplement. <laughs> but I, 
like <laughs> yeah so I think it's like in situations like those like mm-hmm. is it okay to just like say that but then like as long as like you're going over and explaining like why it sounds like that and like giving suggestions mm-hmm. like is it still okay to do that hmm again I, I would I would look why does it sound awkward so it, and it's a valid feeling Renee I get it I, I get that feeling a lot I bet anyone that reviews multiple times throughout the review get the feeling that sounds weird but what I do is why does it sound weird is it because they used a word that my community doesn't use is it because um, the syntax the order of the words is a natural so I so yes valid feeling but I try to include in the comment the why and then the most important part how I think how I would say it or where or which term I would prefer in that in that context that really gives weight to the to the revision great these are good um, how about, would it be fair to summarize that perfection in translation is not necessary and good enough is enough? Well, I would say perfection in life is almost impossible. <laughs> and it's just that there's so many ways to say the same thing, right? And it depends on what we were, what Kelly mentioned before, diversity will give so many perspectives to, to the way that we can say something. Um, as long as the translation is accurate, respects style and respects tone, and it is culturally appropriate, those those are those are good building blocks. Um, I bet you can always make something sound prettier if you work on it over and over and over. And um, I, I get that feeling. Oh, I could make this sound better, but sometimes you just don't have the time. Yeah, I'm thinking of something. I think I went to a management class once. It was the 80-20 principle. Um, Prioritize 80% of your work that will have the biggest impact. And, you know, I'm not quoting it very well, but 20% you can um, minimize or not spend as much priority on it um, to do a pretty darn good job. And so that's not in translation, but maybe that kind of concept. No need to be super poetic. <laughs> yes, you need to be informative and clear and accurate. Yes. <laughs> okay, here's one. I have never heard of this. Um, do you know about Deepl? D e e p l. Deepl Translate. What do you it, think? Of I it? believe. I believe it's software translation software. I believe. I haven't used it. I've only used MemoQ and Trados. Um and. So I don't know people, but I believe it's translation software. Okay. Anyone knows a lot about that? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and it is interesting. I just want to say it's very interesting. These uh, translation groups that I went out and found, um, and we'll get to Jing next, uh, very Western European um and Spanish, generally, I don't know what region, and then Eastern European uh, translators are very active. But I kept wondering, where are the Asian language translators in these group? It seems like they weren't in these conversations. So I don't know where they are kind of collaborating with their peers. It's kind of interesting. And it made me think of Deepl. Um, it sounds like it's somewhat uh, culturally or language more specific than Google, for example. Mm-hmm. This and half toggle of Filipino. Hmm. Uh, Jean, I bet you want to say something. Oh, yeah. Uh, I uh, raised that question about Depot. So, for my limited experience, I think for Chinese, Depot works better than Google. Interesting. Mm, okay. I'm just asking for <laughs> your ideas. And mm-hmm. sorry, I'm turn off my. Mike, which I just realized, I hope I didn't make any noise. And one more uh, word you did it. about uh, perfection. Uh, I try to make the translation uh, better 
probably not perfect because I think it's the state government election material. So I think I'm expecting a higher standard of translation. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of times I think of the people we serve are people I, I do on, on site uh, interpreting. So I meet a lot of LEP uh, people. So I always think, oh, they understand this. Uh, it's not just English, it's also the, you know, uh, education background information and people from a different system. So <clears throat> that's all what I wanted to say. Thank you. Yes. And uh, I really appreciate that we all do that. Um, the, the translations reflect on the agency. They reflect on every county and elected officials and um, appointed officials. And so there's nothing here that I hope, I hope the message isn't that we're minimizing the accuracy or um, the quality. So, but mm -hmm. so thankful for all of your work. They hey. had a question before. Uh, yeah. David, would you repeat your question, please? Me? Yes, uh, please. I Tagalish. Mean, uh, um, Chantal already um, uh, answered, pretty well answered it earlier. Um, my question was about um, when um, English words get passed straight through um, from uh, the English into the translation. Um, and very often, um, uh, uh, I'll, so, and what I got from Chantal was that if there is a Tagalog equivalent, then uh, we should go with the Tagalog equivalent. So I'll, uh, I'll make sure in my reviews to tell the uh, translators not to be lazy about it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Don't use the word lazy, please. I won't. But. <laughs> <laughs> Politely and um, respectfully. <laughs> yes. And also there are a couple languages, uh, the Tagalog and Marshallese in our style guide, where we said there might be more exceptions to uh, English loan words, or I don't even know if, no, if there are called loan words, um, because my understanding is that because of the colonization and settlers mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, a lot of them have been incorporated as as the true blue um, mm -hmm. language. And by the way, Marshallese is not in Google Translate. <laughs> I bet Lowell already knows that. So yeah, there's another, there's another angle there. Um, okay, we've got a question for Chantal. Um, when can you use the whole meaning instead of word by word translation? Ah, yes, that's a hard one, especially mm. with some of the selection material. When can you use the whole meaning instead of word? I, I think we should always use the whole meaning because word per word translation will result in what I was talking about. Um, when you follow the structure of the original too close and it creates a break in, in communication. So um, what I do when I translate is I read the sentence and then I look elsewhere and I translate it. So I don't translate together with the English. I try to separate myself, understand what I'm reading, and provide my Spanish translation. Um, so I would say always. It's always to go, it's best to go by meaning than word per word translation. Yeah. And we've all read some of those on packages and things that come from <laughs> Amazon. You open it up and you're like, what? <laughs> yeah, that's actually word for word, but it's not what it means. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. And when I went, made my comment about Google Translate being good, that was based on my language pair, English, Spanish. So I am sure that many of the languages this committee works with, <laughs> Google Translate is not good. But with English and Spanish, it, it's pretty good. And we have a comment from Loie, and I would like to point out, I worked with Loie also at the Judicial Department, and she is one of the fabulous and uh, small population who are ATA certified also as a German translator, Loie. <laughs> uh, the opposite can also be true with English loan words. 
for example, they look like English, but there's nonetheless a difference in meaning or even structure. Mm -hmm. So have, I think have people mm -hmm. experienced that as well? Mm -hmm. yeah, lovely. Uh, so this is Mira Weimer. I'm a Korean interpreter or translator. Yes. Mira. And I like to give a uh, credit to Korean translators. Uh, give lots of credits. They've been doing a really good job. I think at the beginning when I first joined the Translation Advisory Council, uh, it was a little bit uh, like, I think I I need to do, put in more, more time and work when I review the materials. But I think uh, over the years, they become so good. I don't have to do as much work put in. So I really like to give them a credit. But there's one thing I like to ask question about to Chantel. So when it comes to loan words, like, by the way, the Korean is has got the different word order from English. It's almost mm -hmm. the opposite. So it's not always easy. But <clears throat> I think the Korean translator did a really good job. But there's... Uh, when it comes to the loan words, I was wondering uh, which would be better, like stay close to how your community pronounce it or say, or uh, I'm, I'm talking about the romanization of the loan words. For example, Oregon, uh, this translator keep uh, translate Ori Oregon, Oregon. But that's not how we say it in Korean. Uh, in Korean community, we say Oregon. Mm -hmm. So I'm. I was a little bit confused. Do we need to like uh, choose the one that's more widely accepted in our community, or do we need to choose the one that sounds? more close to the native native speaker's pronunciation. Excellent. Um, I would say um, check your language academy and see or your um, dictionary, English, Korean, and see if that is translated in that dictionary. I know that this is a big issue of content, uh, of, of discussion between Spanish translators. Is some prefer to use Oregon in English, others prefer to use Oregon with the accent mark in Spanish. So, um, reputable source and check there, see if that is actually, if there's an official translation, and that can solve a lot of decision making. Excellent. Yeah, and I read a little comment about the style guide. Again, that's an evolving um, person as <laughs> Chantal <language>. translations, they're <laughs> evolving. Um, and right now we're directing uh, the translators to leave names of addresses, locations, um, and so on in English. So Oregon would be one. And the reason mm -hmm. is um, because this is a written voters pamphlet that um sometimes they have the ballots are not translated for example so we want them to be able to match things or if they want to look up a mm -hmm. campaign committee online they want to be able to match the name of the oregon committee um mm -hmm. to to make that connection um but yeah we're we're open to ideas and we're always thinking of the end user um what would be the best for their voting experience and usually well, you wouldn't translate addresses, so that is a very good way to proceed. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we're <laughs> learning as we go, and we need everyone's input. Uh, Marsa, could you flip back to the break slide, which had the dates on it? And um, I just want to make sure everyone catches that. You're going to be hearing from us soon. We will be working on the May election materials beginning next week. And um, we are going to use file share as before. So that's where you get an email with a link and you download the files that you're going to review. You don't rename them 
and you do your review and then you get a link to send them back to us. And it seems to be an efficient, secure way to send things back and forth. Multnomah County has, uh, they print some of the translations. If you live there, you've seen those in the mail. And so they have an earlier timeline. They have staff who review Vietnamese and Spanish for us um, of their own pamphlets. And then we have Chinese, Russian, and Korean reviewers from the council. Look at those. So that's coming up next week, um, as well as everyone, um, most everyone should be getting some reviews of state and county general voter information. Um, and these things are typically over about three days, um, and they're not all on weekends this time. It's a big election, and there's a lot of material coming in. Ah, Ukrainian too, Marcia said, um, for Multnomah. And then something in the statewide elections, like the primary in general, is that filers can submit their own translations, which can be pretty interesting. Um, and our council has the role of reviewing those to make sure that the English and the translation have the same meaning and that the meaning wasn't changed or things weren't added or omitted from the English translation. So I can't tell you if you're going to get those or not, but um, we will have a few of those probably floating through in um, some of the more, probably some of the top five languages and maybe some others too. Then we're into April. State ballot measures are going to come back and county ballot measures. And then um, we really appreciate people who are available during the production week for the online pamphlet who could check formatting and make sure that we didn't like chop up a word or do something inadvertently while putting it on the website. Okay. Uh, Kelly, if I, mm -hmm. if I may suggest uh, that we include these uh, timelines into our follow-up email so that everybody have these uh, dates handy. Yes, and I typically send out an email saying, hey, I'm going to be sending something to you next week. Alert, alert. <laughs> so, yeah, definitely. OK, I think we're ready to close tomorrow. You want uh, to do closing tonight? Sure. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chantal and Kelly, for putting this training together. It's uh, much needed. And uh, for me personally, there was a lot of food for thought. And I hope that uh, um, uh, council members share uh, this feeling. And um, I also want to thank um, uh, council members for active participation in those polls and uh, asking questions. I'm sure there will be more questions as you digest the information that you've heard today. And special thanks uh, to Chantal, who shared her tremendous experience. And uh, uh, it was extremely, extremely helpful, especially considering that we'll have to do a lot of reviews uh, in the next few months. Uh, so um, uh, what uh, I would suggest, uh, uh, what really struck me uh, from what Chantal was saying, that uh, if there's a remarkable translation that you really like, don't hesitate to say so. So I want to suggest <laughs> a change to the review form uh, because really there were cases when I could give a standing ovation to a brilliant translation. So uh, mm -hmm. if there is a checkbox for that, I would definitely use it every <laughs> now and then. <laughs> and a checkbox makes it more efficient. <laughs> <laughs> you Thank you so yeah. much for having me tonight again. What you do is so incredibly important. I wish it was part of this committee, but it was a pleasure to be able to share this time with you. Who knows? Maybe someday I will be part keep of the applying. community. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> keep so up. Over. <laughs> All applications stay on file. <laughs> yes. All right. Okay, thank good. you. We we did a great job on time, and um, thank you again. Thank so you, we everyone. have a entire mm. agenda for now. Uh, so uh, uh, the, for the next meeting, uh, it will be uh, most likely an in-person meeting sometime in summer. And in the follow-up email, or maybe a little bit, a little bit later, uh, we will send out a little poll uh, to check everybody's availability for an in-person meeting uh, like the one we had last summer. And uh, well, thanks again for your very active participation and uh, see you in a few months. Great. And congratulations, Renee and Angelo. Yes. See you guys in July. Bye, everyone.
Mm-hmm. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.